morning, everyone. We are so grateful and honored that you have joined us this morning. And whether you are a member of First Christian or simply found our service online and are looking for inspiration, we welcome you to this time and space. You may have noticed at the end of last week's service that we have welcomed a brand new member of the First Christian family. Our music minister, Casey, her husband, Andrew, and their son, Jackson, welcomed home little baby boy, Philip, last week. And so we just wanna to continue to celebrate with them this beautiful gift of new life, and we cannot wait until we can see Philip in person. This week, we'd like to especially give our thanks to our worship team, Gilda, Celia, and JT for lending their amazing talents with us. We'd also like to thank Curtis and Tim for lending their voices to this service, for giving us uh, scripture and an update about all that is going on in the church. We are so grateful for the ways that this community has continued to support one another, both in this space and from your homes, calling one another and asking how you can help us. We are just so grateful that we have really stepped up to be the church, even when we can't be in church. And so with that, we prepare our minds and hearts for worship. We welcome you to this service. Good morning. I'm so glad to have this time with you again this week. And I brought something with me today. You can probably tell that it's a starfish. Because this morning, I'd like to share with you the parable of the starfish. One day, an old man was walking on the beach and he observed thousands, literally thousands of starfish that had been washed ashore because of a violent storm the night before. And as he walked on a little further, he saw a young boy who was tossing the starfish back into the ocean. So when he got closer to him, he asked the young boy, what are you doing? There's thousands of these starfish. What could you possibly think you're doing? He said, well, I'm tossing them back in the ocean. And the old man chuckled and he said, I just told you, there's thousands of these starfish. How can you possibly be making a difference? And the young boy looked up at him as he gently tossed another into the ocean and he said, it matters to this one. So I want us to think, over the past weeks, these days have turned into weeks and you may be comparing yourself to how other people are helping out and judging yourself a little too harshly. So I want you to know that God has given each one of us unique gifts. And I want you to continue doing just what you've been doing. You can still call a friend. You can help around the house. You can give encouragement to other people. And this week, if you look at the bulletin, we have a starfish that you can color. And I would love to send them out to our homebound folks again. So I want you to remember, you can make a difference one person at a time. So please bow your heads and pray with me. Dear Heavenly Father, help us feed your lambs. Help us go out into the world and show your love for one another. Help us respect our unique gifts as we make a difference, one person at a time. In your name we pray. Amen. Have a great week. See you soon.
uh, seeking you as a precious jewel. Lord, to give up, I'd be a fool. You are my all in all. Jesus, Lamb of God, worthy is your name. Jesus, Lamb of God, worthy is your name. Taking my sin, my cross, my shame, rising again, I bless your name. You are my all in all. When I fall down, you pick me up. When I am dry, you fill my cup. You are my all in all. We've come to the time in our service as we do each week to remember those concerns that are on the hearts and minds of our members and their loved ones. In particular, we have had many calls this week about folks being in the hospital, having falls, and so we direct you to our bulletin to, to read those who have recently called in and ask for the community to be in prayer with them. We hold them in our hearts this day, and we hold on to as well that hope that they will find healing and that they will be able to come out of this stronger than ever. And so if you will join me in prayer, let us go to God. Most holy God, we are a people desperately in need of you as the creator, redeemer, and sustainer of all things. Our lives have complications and pain, our world has lack and despair, but we were made in your image, and your spirit was breathed into us that we might experience hope in your goodness. Yet, God, there are situations that make it hard to be aware of that goodness. We pray now for those whose lives are affected by illness, grief, fear, and loneliness. Be with them, Lord. Heal them and show them your comfort. And direct us, O oh Lord, to know how best to care for those who most need your love. This we ask in the name of our Savior, your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Greetings to my friends at First Christian. I'm Curtis Ray, your Facilities and Maintenance Committee Chair. I'm here tonight to provide you an update on what our team has been up to for the past several weeks. First, I'd like to say just how much our family and I have truly missed worshiping with you these past several weeks. It seems as if we're all stuck in neutral. Vacation plans, celebrations, graduations, all put on hold. But rest assured that facilities and maintenance has been busy. As you can see, we now have a beautiful rail to complement our new steps. Being new to this committee, I had no idea how much went into putting up a set of rails. I thought I would throw it together in a couple of weeks. Boy, was I wrong. But I thank God for the resources that were made available to me. I realize that when mentioning names that you run the risk of forgetting someone, but I feel compelled to thank a few. Kathy has been as supportive a board chair as I could ever hope to have. Tisha's help with budget guidance has been crucial. And for a guy who honestly didn't even know how to get the check cut for Stevenson's meal work, it was absolutely necessary, and I thank her for it. Uh, Randy has done a beautiful job staining our rails. Barry Lamb has been an absolute gem. His career has prepared him to be an expert in just about everything building-related. His advice, presence, and sourcing efforts have been a true blessing. And last, but certainly not least, Dennis Daniels. I walked into the chapel the other day and I saw two molded rails and three long pieces of wood. Dennis applied his considerable talent to those elements and what you see now is the result of that effort. Dennis, the rails are beautiful. 
It is the hope of the entire facilities and maintenance team uh, that the rails will be enjoyed for years to come, and we look forward to when we can all be together again. God bless and be safe. Our scripture is from John chapter 21, verses 1 through 19. Afterward, Jesus appeared again to his disciples by the Sea of Galilee. It happened this way. Simon Peter, Thomas, also known as Didymus, Nathaniel from Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee and two other disciples were together. I'm going out to fish Simon Peter told them, and they said, we'll go with you. So they went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not realize that it was Jesus. He called out to them, friends, haven't you any fish? No, they answered. He said, throw your net on the right side of the boat, and you will find some. When they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. Then the disciple who Jesus loved said to Peter, It is the Lord. As soon as Simon Peter heard him say, It is the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him, for he had taken it off, and jumped into the water. The other disciples followed in the boat towing the net full of fish, for they were not far from shore, only about a hundred yards. When they landed, they saw a fire burning coals there with fish on it and some bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish you have just caught. So Simon Peter climbed back into the boat and dragged the net ashore. It was full of large fish, 153 but even with so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, Come and have breakfast. None of the disciples dared ask him, Who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came, took the bread, and gave it to them, and did the same with the fish. This was now the third time Jesus appeared to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. 
The third time he said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. Very truly, I tell you, when you were younger, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted. But when you're old, you will stretch out your hands and someone will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. Then he said to him, follow me. The word of God for the people of God. Our scripture reading for this morning was taken from the last chapter of John's gospel. But before we dive into this chapter, I'd actually like to take us back just one more time to the resurrection story in John chapter 20. You see, there's a lot going on in this passage of scripture we just heard, and chapter 20 provides us with some much needed context. You'll of course remember that in John's gospel, Mary Magdalene is the first to discover that Jesus has risen from the dead. Shocked by what she finds and unsure of what it means, she runs to tell the other disciples. Now, for the past two weeks, I've pretty much glossed over what happens next, but it's in these next few verses, I believe, will help us understand the gravity of today's passage. So the text says that Mary ran to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, which, if you're Peter, has to sting a little, right? I mean, there's Peter, and then there's the disciple that Jesus loved. But anyway, in verse 2, she says to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. So the text says that Peter set out with the other disciple, and they were going toward the tomb. Both of them were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. Mm -hmm. He saw the linen cloths lying there and the face cloths which had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen cloths, but folded up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went in. He saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. Then the other disciples went back home. I don't know if you caught it, but there's a bit of a rivalry going on here. I mean, John is telling us about the resurrection what we affirm to be the greatest event in human history, and yet he takes the time to give us petty details like who is faster? What is he thinking? What we know about Peter from John's Gospel is that when Jesus was on trial, alone, about to be crucified, Peter denies ever knowing him. John includes this. And what we know is that Jesus commands the beloved disciple to take his mother into his own home. And now we know that the beloved disciple is faster than Peter. I mean, he outruns him to the tomb, and when he finds it empty, the text says he believes. Fast forwarding a little, we come to today's story, in which Jesus surprises his disciples with breakfast on the beach and sits down to have a one-on-one with Peter. His primary question for Peter is this. Do you love me? Peter, do you love me? Three times he asks him this, and the text says that Peter was grieved that the Lord would question his devotion. Still, though, Jesus gives Peter a sacred task. Essentially, he says, Peter, pastor my people, lead the church. And he ends this calling in verse 19 with the words, follow me. Jesus commissions Peter in this holy moment. Follow me, Peter. Take my mission on yourself. Feed my sheep. And what is his response to this weighty call that the resurrected Lord of the universe has just given him? Well, we read in verse 20 following, Peter turned and saw the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, following them. When Peter saw him, He said to Jesus, Lord, what about this man? 
Peter wants to know, what about him? What are you going to give him to do? Is it going to be fair? And Jesus says to Peter, if it is my will that he remain until I come, what is that to you? You follow me. A number of years ago, I attended a student-led Ash Wednesday service at my seminary. The theme for the service was idolatry, the idea being that we all have certain preoccupations which distract our attention from God. But, we thought, if we can name them, confess the ways we've worshipped them, and repent, we have faith that God will not only forgive us, but bring our devotion back to where it needs to be. We arranged the chairs in a circle for the service, and at the center of the circle was a table filled with candles. After the sermon, the preacher invited us, if we felt comfortable, to openly confess those things that we considered idols and to light a candle to symbolically let go of our devotion to them. We were told that at the end, all the candles would be extinguished, and then we were left to it. A few people, not many, but a few people shared their idols with the group. Things like good grades, their children's achievements, desired incomes or relationship dreams. And each of them rolled off me as if I had heard the standard list of idols a million times. But then, a girl, a girl I didn't know very well, shared... Um, Oh, okay, sorry. I'll start again. <clears throat> but then a girl, a girl I didn't know very well but shared a few classes with, stood up and said, you are my idols. This semester I've invested what at times feels like all of my energy caring about what you think of me, how I measure up to your standards. Of this, I repent. And what was already a silent collection of people staring at a table of flickering candles somehow became even more deadly still. As this woman walked through the seats, picked up a lighter, and lit a solitary candle, we all knew stood for every one of us. Church, I am convinced that during that service, she began the lengthy, painful process of answering that very question that Jesus poses to Peter. What is that to you? What is that to you? Have you ever stopped to consider all the subtle, petty ways that you and I get our happiness from measuring ourselves against someone else? I mean, how often do we let the impulse to compare ourselves make us miserable? And maybe today Jesus is asking us, what is that to you? This is not just an individual impulse. I think whole groups do it, businesses, churches even. Well, Jesus, what about them? They have so much more funding than we do. They have the most creative ideas, the right people, the best location, the nicest building, whatever it is we determine the better thing to be. We think, I know we're supposed to be fulfilling the vision you gave us, but what about them? Is it really going to be fair? Underlying this complaint lurks something ominous. What we really want to know is, why didn't you make us like them? We envy others because we wish we weren't like we are. We wish we were funnier, thinner, younger, smarter, wealthier, a better parent, a savvier leader. We ask Jesus, what about them? Because we want to know, why not us? When we do this, we are fundamentally admitting that we're not okay with who God made us to be. This, I believe, is what Peter confronts that morning on the beach with Jesus. Of course, Peter is not the first person to wrestle with insecurity. In fact, it pops up throughout the scriptures. One of the most interesting places that God addresses the con these concerns is in the original Ten Commandments, found in the book of Exodus, chapter 20. 
Now, if you study them closely, you'll find that the first nine are kind of the same and that they're all externally observable. So for instance, you can witness a murder, overhear a lie, catch a thief. It's only the 10th commandment, the one about coveting, desiring something that belongs to someone else that happens somewhere deep inside of us. How do you know if someone is coveting? How do you know the person sitting next to you isn't coveting right now? You don't. It's an inward, invisible temptation, one that feels especially difficult to avoid. So scholars have asked, why is this one so different from the others? Well, first of all, a better translation for what we normally call the Ten Commandments is something like the Ten Pronouncements, or even more simply, the Ten Words. God lays down ten words that shape what life lived under God's reign should look like. We usually translate verse 14, you shall not covet, but it can also mean you will not covet. Translated like this, it sounds less like a choice and more like a promise. Keep numbers one through nine and you won't covet. In other words, when you honor your father and mother, show fidelity to your spouse, tell the truth, take only what is yours and keep all the other commandments, you won't want anyone else's life. That's true contentment. That's what sets us free. God invites us to live without envy because God knows how dangerous it can be. As one Jewish scholar commented about this 10th commandment, desire is predatory. It eats at our hearts. In its place, God seeks to seal the passion of the covenant to make our hearts whole. Desire is predatory. You can't just have a little harmless jealousy here and there and think that you won't, it won't come after you. The commentator says desire hunts you down. It feeds off your self-worth. Ironically, the book of 1 Peter puts it this way. Be alert and sober of mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around, roaring like a lion, looking for someone to devour. The Ten Commandments are God's promise that when we focus our energies on God's plan to make the world a better place, we will begin to feel comfortable in our own skin. In verse 19 of the passage, Jesus tells Peter, Someday you will be led where you do not wish to go. He said this to indicate the manner of death by which he, Peter, will glorify God. Another translation of the word indicate in the Greek is to give a sign. This phrase is significant. In John's gospel, signs are a big deal. In this gospel, Jesus' miracles are called signs. And by performing signs, Jesus is revealing his identity as the Son of God and long-awaited Messiah. John seems to be hinting that Peter's mission will announce to the world that Jesus was exactly who he claimed to be and that his resurrection has all sorts of implications for us. It's quite an honor. Jesus is asking Peter to be a resurrection herald, a holy and living proclamation that the kingdom of God has been inaugurated right here and now. But Peter is unable to celebrate his own calling because he's too busy worrying about what the beloved disciple will be asked to do. How many times has God invited us to step into who we are, a mission that uniquely expresses our gifts and talents, only to be sidetracked and distracted by worrying about what other people are doing, what other people have been given? In the past 10 years of ministry, I have had the privilege of meeting some really incredible people. I mean people who are literally changing the world. Some of my former seminary classmates are championing issues like affordable housing and racial reconciliation, or taking on whole systems of injustice like poverty and immigration reform. In other words, it's easy to begin the comparisons. When I evaluate myself against their talents, 
I consistently find that they are better writers, savvier problem solvers, more skilled listeners, and certainly better preachers. More often than not, when I run into these people, something within me wants to hand them my calling and say, here, you take it. You do something amazing with it. But as soon as I do, I'm instantly transported back in time, sitting on a beach talking with Jesus. The air is warm and salty. I can hear the sounds of men laboring to drag in a giant catch of fish onto shore as the waves lap at their feet. And me, with my head turned away from Jesus to observe my fellow seminarians and all their world changing. And I hear the convicting words of Jesus. Lee, what is that to you? You follow me. How can we be at peace with ourselves? And how can we be at peace with others if secretly we wish we had what they've been given? We were created to connect with people and enjoy relationships for what they are. So what if all the comparing could be replaced with connecting? The reality is none of us have it all together. And we are all in need of grace, and it is the resurrected Christ sitting on the beach with Peter that offers it to us. Which means that our righteousness is not our own. And if our fundamental identity as Christians is based on something outside of our own accomplishments, then there is no basis on which to compare. We are all equal in our need to be seen and loved just as we are. And God, the only being capable of such a task, has called each and every one of you to do something holy and set apart. I believe that if we can love and accept ourselves as we are, then and only then can we begin to love others exactly as they are. This is the power that enables to us to love the outcast and to work for the full inclusion and equality of all people. So, as you go about this week and jealousy inevitably begins to creep in, ask yourself, what is that to me? Begin the painful process of self-examination. Once you do this, I promise you that God will redirect you towards an appreciation of your own journey. Friends, let us hold on to God's unique vision for our church, for your family, for you individually, and for me. May we give our full attention and gratitude to the resurrected Jesus, who liberates us from the bondage of wanting someone else's life. And then sends us out to proclaim the good news. Christ is risen. The captives are set free. Thank you.
service where we share our tithes and offerings. First of all, I just want to say thank you on behalf of our community for the generosity that has been shown during this time. People have gone out of their way to make sure that the church has the resources it needs to be in ministry with the most vulnerable among us and to take care of those needs that we have right here in this place. Secondly, I'd like to thank Kenneth for coming last week to tell us uh, about this new option of online giving and our Realm system, which will be able to keep track of all of those changes of information that go on in the community so that we can truly have an accurate view of where folks are and, and continue to update our directories to have the most current information. If you have not had a chance to sign into this Realm system, if you go to our website and go to the option of giving, it will direct you there. And even if you don't plan to make an online gift, we hope that you will set up an account so that you can continue to update it with the most current information that you have. Of course, you can continue to give in person. Um, I, for one, am in the online system and I'm very excited about it. And so thank you to Kenneth and to all of those who've been on that team working so hard to make this happen. It is especially handy to have in this time when we can't physically gather together. And so we thank you for these offerings and tithes, and we now come to the time where we go to the table, where we receive what God has to give us. again to this table, Christ's table, which he set up in so many places with so many people, including Peter on the beach that morning. And so we remember that it is here we find the grace we need, and it is because of that last meal that Jesus had with his friends, in which he took the bread that was before them, he broke it and gave thanks to God, saying to each of them, Take and eat, this is my body, broken for you. Eat this and remember me. And when the supper was ended, he took the cup that was before them. Again, he gave thanks and blessed it and gave it to his friends saying, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood, the blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for all for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you raise a glass, remember me. And so this morning, wherever you are and whatever you have in front of you, I pray that it will be that grace that God gives us so that we may not only accept ourselves as we are, but others as they are. 
In grateful appreciation for these gifts, we turn to God in prayer. Please join me in prayer. God of new life, we are reminded of a new day when the risen Christ stood on the lake shore with Peter and the others. Help us to be as thrilled as they were as we meet our risen Lord at this table. We gather to eat this bread and drink this wine in celebration and honor of our Lord Jesus Christ. As we leave this table, let us be a blessing to others. In the name of Christ we pray, amen. Please join us in praying the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Who made the world? Who made the swan and the black bear? Who made the grasshopper? This grasshopper, I mean. The one who has flung herself out of the grass. The one who is eating sugar out of my hand. Who is moving her jaws back and forth instead of up and down. Who is grazing around with her enormous and complicated eyes. Now she lifts her pale forearms and thoroughly washes her face. Now she snaps her wings open and floats away. I don't know exactly what a prayer is. I do know how to pay attention, how to fall down into the grass, how to kneel down in the grass, how to be idle and blessed, how to stroll through fields, which is what I have been doing all day. Tell me, what else should I have done? Doesn't everything die at last and too soon? Tell me. What is it you plan to do with your one wild and precious life?